Hello, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, welcome back to the Pazia Colloquium. Um, this is uh, just uh, for me, just uh, from me, just I'm Giacomo Beccari. I just wanted to to welcome again to the to the new event after the break that we had because um, because of the, the cosmic duologues. So uh, let me remind you, the Pazia Colloquium is meant to for early career astronomer series and and uh, we have uh, the, the, we would like every time to congratulate with our, with the people who uh, with the students with the young uh, astronomer who got uh, the, the slot for the talk because they were selected after a very competitive um, selection process. There was uh, the pressure was very high, and we are very pleased. And of course, we encourage everyone next to again in the future to to keep. Uh, pushing and, and, and trying to, to join us in this beautiful uh, and enjoyable uh, series of events. The, just to give you some technicalities on my, from my point, so the, um, the talk is broadcasted online, uh, live on YouTube, so uh, people who are attending the talk on YouTube will be able to give, to make questions uh, using the chat, the live chat, and we will, the, the, the moderator will uh, pass them to the speaker. Uh, while the people attending the meeting on Zoom, they they can basically raise their hand or communicate that they are willing to make a question using the chat. And uh, when the speaker gives the floor, then they can turn on the microphone and the camera, and then they can make the question themselves to the speaker. The speakers they have a 30 minutes slot each. And um, and with this today we will have two uh, again two. Moderators, they are Gabriela Calisto Rivera, she is uh, our ESO fellow, expert on galaxies, and uh, Steven Moulineux, who is uh, at ESO with a studentship uh, and with us, and uh, they will be chairing, co chairing the, the, the two sessions. So, with this, I will now disappear and I will give the thought to Gabi, I guess, who is going to make the introduction. And thank you very much again. And enjoy, of course. Thank you very much, Giacomo. And hello, everyone. Welcome to the Hipatia Colloquium of today. Uh, my name is Gabriela Calisto Rivera, as Giacomo mentioned, and I'm an ESO fellow um, in Garting. Uh, today, it's a pleasure for me to uh, be chairing this event together with Stephen Molinier. And uh, I will start. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce the speakers of today, which are uh, Nikki Saville and Ash Barnes. And uh, I will start uh, introducing Nikki. Uh, Nikki is a, a current uh, postdoctoral researcher at the University of Groningen, and uh, she did her PhD at the Cardiff University. And today she will talk uh, to us about galaxy evolution in dense environments, uh, a study of the cold ISM in the four next clusters. Uh, please, Nikki, uh, go ahead. Thank you very much for the nice introduction and thank you very much for having me here as well. I'm really excited to be here and talk to you all about my research. Just give me one second to share my screen. Okay, that should be working. Okay, so first of all, apologies for not turning on my camera today. I developed a little bit of an eye infection overnight, so I'm not super comfortable. And also, I don't look super fabulous, so I thought it would be best for all of us involved if I leave my camera off today. Instead, I put up a picture of uh, me during my PhD defense, which is kind of fitting because I had that here only a couple of weeks ago from the same room, actually. Um, which is also why today I would like to tell you a little bit more about what I did in my PhD. So my PhD was about galaxy evolution in dense environments. More specifically, it was focused really on the molecular gas in galaxies in dense environments, and more specifically even, it was focused on molecular gas in Fornix cluster galaxies. Uh, and the Fornix cluster, you can see it here in the background of my slides as well. So before I properly dive in, it would be actually really nice for me to have a little bit of a better idea of who I'm actually talking to today, because obviously I cannot really see any of you. So it would be really nice for me if you could maybe pop down in the, in the YouTube chat your name, your position, what you study, where you are. I probably won't have time to look at all of it now, but it would be really fun for me to be able to see this afterwards as well. Okay, let's start then at the very beginning. 
galaxy clusters. So when I imagine a galaxy clusters, this is basically what I picture. We've got this really big, bright elliptical galaxy sitting in the center of the cluster. And then we have all kinds of uh, satellite galaxies that are orbiting around this elliptical. They have all kinds of different shapes and sizes. They're on all kinds of different orbits. And as you can see, you create this pretty chaotic environment in this way in which a lot is going on. And from clusters, we also see this light that you can see here in our case, then in the shape of X-rays uh, from the hot intercluster medium. And as you can imagine, in a very chaotic environment like this one, galaxy evolution is a little bit different from galaxies that are more isolated galaxies in the so-called field. So that's what we are going to focus on a little bit more today. So just to really wrap it up in a nutshell, Virginia already explained this really nicely during the very first talk in this series, um, what are galaxy clusters? So they are basically gravitationally bound structures bound together by a dark matter halo consisting of typically several hundreds to thousands of galaxies. They're typically a few megaparsecs in size and they share this hot intercluster medium, which will become important for some things we will discuss later on. And we can see that really nicely in this picture also here because it emits, uh, emits X-rays as a result of the Bremsstrahlung that is uh, going on in galaxy clusters. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, because clusters are quite chaotic places, the galaxy population and the galaxy evolution in them is a little bit different from field galaxies. And this is summed up really nicely in this famous plot here. It's the morphology density relation from Dressler 1980. And what is shown here is basically the fraction of a specific type of galaxy in the population on the y-axis as a function of galaxy number density on the x-axis. So the line highlighted here in blue represents the spiral galaxies over here, and the line represented here in red uh, is the elliptical galaxy, such as the one over here. And what you can see really nicely is that the denser your uh, environment gets in terms of the number of galaxies, the lower your fraction of spiral galaxies gets and the higher your fraction of elliptical galaxies gets uh, until in the very densest places in the universe, the galaxy clusters, eventually um, elliptical galaxies start to outnumber the spiral galaxies. So this basically, um, strongly suggests that something about dense environments, something about the cluster environment makes um, the quenching of uh, star formation in galaxies take place more rapidly than in the field. So um, there's basically things going on that uh, transform these spiral galaxies into retired elliptical galaxies at a higher rate than in the field. So a number of different processes have actually been suggested to be responsible for this transformation. Some really nice cartoons uh, made here by Eri Chung uh, sum these up really nicely in this slide. And I will highlight some of them in the next couple of slides as well, some of the more important ones. So first of all, we have starvation or strangulation. This is basically a result mostly of the gravitational potential uh, of the cluster. So typically in the field, galaxies have some, um, some atomic gas sitting at higher, uh, higher scale heights, or there's some free floating atomic gas that they can sort of accrete later in their lifetimes. So as they continue to use up the gas in the star formation cycle, they always have some fresh gas coming in, which is new fuel uh, that is provided for the star formation. And so they can continue to form stars. However, in a cluster, galaxies really rapidly lose this loosely bound gas to the cluster potential. There's not a lot of free floating H1 gas because they are surrounded by this hot intercluster medium. And so as a galaxy continue to form stars, it just runs out of fuel and eventually the star formation will be quenched. So this is one way in which this happens. Another way is simply the result of having so many galaxies in so little space relatively. So when two galaxies meet in the field, they typically tend to merge, which is one of the more important evolutionary processes of field galaxies. Instead, in galaxy clusters, as you could see in the video I showed earlier, the relative velocities between the different galaxies are really high. So this means that when two galaxies cross paths, they basically, they don't merge, but they have these very violent, very um, yeah, short and violent interactions, basically, in which they can really mess up each other's gas content, each other's stellar distribution, but in the end, they both go in separate directions again. And this can also eventually lead to the quenching of star formation in one or both of the galaxies. 
The last one I wanted to highlight is ground pressure stripping. So this is the result of this hot intercluster medium I mentioned. So as a galaxy is on its orbit in the cluster, it really feels a very strong headwind of this hot intercluster medium. And this headwind is basically capable of stripping the gas away from the galaxies, but it leaves the stars unaffected. So you can get, um, as, an effect, as a result, you can basically get that the gas is shifted compared to the stars. And in more extreme cases, you can get these really large tails of gas um, being stripped away from the galaxy, trailing behind it. And as the galaxy loses its gas, its gas eventually um, also its star formation can be quenched. So we have known for quite a while that these um, that all these processes can happen, um, and that yeah, they their relative their relative importance though is not super well understood yet. And one really nice way to trace the different processes is to actually look at the atomic gas because the atomic gas is typically distributed in these really nice extended disks. They are not; it's not super tightly bound. It extends really far out, and so of course this is going to be the first. Uh, phase of the interstellar medium that's going to be strongly affected by these processes. So that's a really good probe of these various processes that I just showed you. But if we really want to understand in more detail how the star formation is quenched, there is one step we are basically missing when we just only look at the atomic gas, and that is the molecular gas. So molecular gas basically forms the intermediate step between um, atomic gas and the actual star formation taking place. Um, so the molecular gas is a lot more tightly bound, it's a lot more centrally located, so it will not be as easy to strip away from galaxies as the atomic gas. Um, but if it can be directly stripped from galaxies along with the atomic gas, that would have very strong implications for the evolution of galaxies in clusters because it is the direct fuel for star formation. So this is why uh, to, um, yeah, so this is basically what my uh, PhD was all about, is to basically study whether the molecular gas in galaxy clusters can be directly affected by the cluster environment. So to study this, we did an ALMA survey of the Fornex cluster, um, of, the, uh, of the molecular gas in the Fornex cluster. So I wanted to start by showing you what uh, the data of this survey typically looked like. So um, this is the kind of uh, maps we were able to make from the ALMA data um, from the survey of the Fornix cluster. So this is an example of a really um, a galaxy that looks really nice and regular in molecular gas, NGC 1387. So what we see on the left here is just uh, an intensity map. So that shows you the morphology of the molecular gas. And as you can see, it is really, uh, it's a really regular looking disk basically. Um, with a central peak and just like, yeah, perfectly regular looking. In the center here, um, we have a velocity map of the molecular gas. So you can see that the side that is blue shifted compared to the systemic velocity of the galaxy and the side that is red shifted are very symmetric. Basically what you're seeing is a very normal, nicely regular rotating disk here. What we see on the right is the same image as the one on the left, except that is now overplotted as, uh, on, uh, as contours on an optical image of the galaxy. And the optical image mostly shows the inner part of the galaxy. In reality, this galaxy is really large, um, but the molecular gas is very centrally located. And as you can see here, it's really sitting in the center of the galaxy and it's really quite compact. So this is just to give you an idea of where the gas is sitting compared to the galaxy. Now here's a second example I wanted to show. This is the dwarf galaxy FCC 90. And I'm showing the same kind of images as the previous example, but what you can see here is that the morphology of this galaxy is a lot more irregular, a lot more chaotic than the one I showed you earlier. So it doesn't really look like a nice disk, but there are multiple peaks, multiple things going on, and it just looks like a very messy molecular gas reservoir. We see the same if we look at the velocity map here. Um, before we could see this really nice and regular rotation, but what you can see here is just a lot more random motions and it's not really nicely rotating disk anymore. Then lastly, if we look at where the molecular gas is compared to the stellar disk of the galaxy, we can see that it's not really sitting nicely in the center, but there's this really big blob, this really big tail of gas that is kind of outside of the galaxy center and outside of the stellar body. So we can really see in this image here that the molecular gas is indeed directly being affected by the environment. 
And what we saw from the entire survey is that uh, more than half of the galaxies that we detected with ALMA had molecular gas reservoirs that were very disturbed and uh, messy like the one we are seeing here. So this is basically suggesting that uh, many galaxies are being directly affected by the, the cluster environment in their CO. So to sum that all up, basically what I'm showing here is molecular gas fractions. So how much molecular gas there is uh, as a, uh, compared to the stellar mass and also as a function of stellar mass here, and then compared to a field sample. So this is the X gold gas sample. The median to the sample is shown with a dashed line here. And then these are the one, two, and three sigma contours. And then all the colored markers are galaxies in the four next cluster. I'm also distinguishing between galaxies with a regular molecular gas reservoir, like the first example I showed you, and galaxies with a disturbed molecular gas reservoir, like the second example I showed you. And then there are two things that basically really stand out from this plot. One is that all galaxies in the Fornex cluster that we detected have systematically lower uh, molecular gas to stellar mass ratios than, than galaxies in the field. Um, so their molecular gas reservoirs are just systematically smaller than field galaxies um, of the same stellar mass. The second one is that all galaxies that are, uh, have lower stellar masses than roughly three times 10 to the nine solar masses all have disturbed molecular gas reservoirs. So this basically suggests that uh, galaxies of lower stellar mass are more easily affected by the cluster environment which basically makes sense because um, their gravitational potentials are just smaller, so it's easier to remove the gas from these galaxies. Right, okay, so what we have seen with this project is basically that yes, the molecular gas can be directly affected by the cluster environment. It can be really uh, stripped away and be disturbed by the cluster environment. So the next question then becomes, is this gas still forming stars or how is the star formation cycle affected in these galaxies with disturbed molecular gas reservoirs? So to do that, uh, we looked into the resolved star formation relation in Fornex uh, cluster galaxies. So the star formation relation basically relates the gas surface density and the star formation rate surface density. And this can give you an idea of um, yeah, how efficiently galaxies are forming stars, basically. So the one I'm showing here is a very famous star formation relation from the literature, the Kanika-Schmidt relation. Uh, and we can do something similar for the galaxies in the Fornix cluster, but in a result way by uh, getting the, uh, the gas surface density from our ALMA data. Um, this relation is for the total gas mass, but a similar one exists for just only the molecular gas mass. So that's what we're doing here. And then we collaborate with the Fornex 3D team, um, which basically is, uh, is a new survey of the Fornex cluster, which you can read all about in SARS et al. 18. And from the MUSE data, we can get H-alpha maps from which we can estimate the star formation rate surface density. So if we relate it to, we can basically create the star formation re uh, relation for the Fornex cluster. So then this is what that looks like. Um, so this is the same, uh, same kind of plot as on the previous slide. I'm indicating here lines of constant depletion time. Depletion time is basically um, if, if the galaxy with the amount of gas it has now continues to form stars at the rate it is forming stars now, how long will it take for the galaxy to basically deplete the gas reservoir to run completely out of gas? And what I should say is that typical spiral galaxies in the field have depletion times of around one to two giga years, so more or less following this line here. So what we can see in the star formation relation of all these four next galaxies is that first of all, there's quite a bit of variety um, in the depletion times between the different galaxies, but also within the different galaxies. Um, but most of the galaxies are distributed roughly around this one giga year line, or towards even shorter depletion times. There's only one dwarf galaxy that has significantly increased depletion times. The rest is all uh, more or less as, uh, similar to spiral galaxies in the field or a shorter depletion times than that. So this figure on the right is showing the same data, except that I'm now overplotting the Kanika-Schmidt relation uh, from the literature, as well as the Begeel relation, which is another star formation relation from the literature. And what you can see is that the four next galaxies um, basically more or less overlap with these relations from the field. And the uh, scatter is mostly towards shorter depletion times. 
So what this basically tells us is that the molecular gas that is present in these galaxies, even if it is less than we expect uh, from field galaxies, it is still forming stars very efficiently, at least as efficient as galaxies uh, in the field do. So because we have these re this resolved data, what we can also do is create star formation relations from, uh, for individual galaxies and also create maps of their depletion times. So I wanted to show again the uh, same example of the same dwarf galaxy that I showed you earlier with the very disturbed molecular gas reservoir. And what you see here, this is the same star formation relation, but just for this galaxy only. And this is a map of its depletion time. So what you can see really nicely here is that the depletion times in the center of this galaxy are really low. They're much lower than uh, one giga year here. But if you look at this molecular gas tail, the, the gas that is being stripped away from this galaxy, there's a very clear transition uh, between the, the center and this tail. And depletion times inside this strip tail are very long. Uh, they are more than, uh, than 10 gig years longer than in the center of this galaxy. So that is really interesting to see as well that this stripped gas is not forming stars so efficiently, but the gas inside the stellar body is forming stars very efficiently. Okay, so the one, the last thing I wanted to talk about is something uh, a little bit different, but also still related, and this is uh, gas to dust ratios in the Fornix uh, galaxy uh, cluster galaxies. So dust is actually also quite important for the star formation cycle. Um, it's a very important catalyst for the formation of molecular gas, which is typically formed on dust grains, but it also shields the molecular gas from radiation, which basically means that it just um, yeah, facilitates the star formation in a way. So for this reason, we expect the molecular gas uh, and the dust to be linked to some extent. So the question then becomes, is dust being stripped away from galaxies similarly to the molecular gas? And some observations of Virgo galaxies have actually shown that um, dust can be stripped away from the centers of galaxies similarly to the gas. So the question is, do we see this happening in the Fornix cluster as well? So I will jump straight to the results. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail as to how we got here, but uh, you can ask me about that later if you like. So what I'm showing here is gas to dust ratios of galaxies in the Fornix cluster, which are again indicated by the red and black markers compared to a field sample. So the field sample is all the gray markers here and the solid line is the median to this field sample. Um, I'm also highlighting galaxies in the Virgo cluster in orange, and in the bottom panel here, you basically see the same thing, except that I'm now showing the cluster galaxies as residuals compared to this field median. And what we can see here is that both in the Fornax and the Virgo clusters, um, the gas to dust ratios are really a lot lower compared to um, field galaxies of fixed stellar mass. Now, this is not super surprising because, as I told you earlier, the atomic gas is really easily stripped away from galaxies. The total gas mass is typically dominated by this atomic gas, so maybe it's not very surprising that gas to dust ratios are uh, low in cluster galaxies. Where it becomes a lot more interesting is when we split out the molecular gas and when we only look at molecular gas to dust ratios. So what we see here is that galaxies in the Fornix cluster also have very, uh, very much suppressed molecular gas to dust ratios compared to field galaxies, whereas galaxies in the Virgo cluster seem to have increased molecular gas to dust ratios compared to the field. So for the Fornix cluster, there are basically two options. It means that either the molecular gas is being stripped from galaxies, but the dust is not stripped as efficiently, or both are stripped from galaxies in the same way, but for some reason, uh, the dust is replenished in a more uh, efficient way. So we have some, gases about, uh, some guesses about this. Uh, I don't have time to explain all of them now, but I'm happy to talk about this later in the questions. So it's really interesting to see that not only the cluster environment has an effect on the gas to dust ratios in galaxies, but even between different kinds of clusters is going to have a really different uh, effect on the gas to dust ratios. Right, so this was all I wanted to share with you today. Um, so I will leave my conclusions up and answer any questions you may have. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Nikki, for this uh, excellent talk. Um, I think we will probably have lots of questions. Uh, I, um, I don't know if some uh, if the people in the Zoom 
uh, meeting have some questions, please let me know. Um, otherwise, Giacomo, it would be nice if you could share the YouTube um, questions as well. Um, to, uh, we received the first questions. I will. I have some as well from my side. So I was wondering uh, if... Gabby, oh, sorry to, yes. to interrupt. Uh, just to say that I see uh, 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 some um, hands are raised um, from, uh, in, on Zoom already. If you don't, just because mm -hmm. maybe you don't, you don't see them, but... Uh, yeah, I don't see them. Okay, there are two... Two, two hands, Il Zhang Yon, and uh, Neven, then there is another name, which is, I don't, I'm not sure, Neven. Tomatich. Okay, good, thank you. So maybe Il Zhang first, and then, yeah, the, sorry, Gabi, if I'm jumping, but because I saw the ends. So, no, 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 thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please go, go ahead with the question. Yeah. Hello, uh, thanks, Nikki, for the very nice presentation. Um, Interested in the plot that you showed that the gas to dust ratio as a function of stellar mass for the Fornax and you show that the distributions are quite different between Virgo and Fornax. Uh, I don't know, but the, is the Fornax and Virgo is different in terms of the, the mass. So it caused a the very different you know, velocity dispersion amongst a the member of the cluster galaxies. So they actual impact of ram pressure stripping could be different for the sample in the Fornax and the Virgo. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, thanks a lot for your question. I'm really glad you're asking that um, actually because uh, I didn't have time to go into this detail, but yeah. Um, so the Fornax and Virgo clusters are actually quite different as you were already suggesting the Virgo cluster is a lot more massive um, uh, and also Virgo is a lot more dynamically active than Fornax. So we've seen in the past years that Fornax is still quite dynamically active, but not quite as much as Virgo. So yeah, one difference could indeed be that um, the ram pressure is a lot stronger in Virgo because it is a lot more uh, massive. So it could be that that plays a role in maybe uh, compressing the gas more efficiently to H2, um, uh, which is why maybe uh, the H2 reservoirs are not so suppressed in Virgo. It could also be that it is uh, a result of an ongoing effect of the uh, ongoing star formation cycle. So maybe it is an effect that takes a little bit more time uh, to become visible, in which case um, uh, it's probably better visible in the Fornix cluster because it is more uh, a bit more settled, a bit more regular. Um, um, so yeah, this could definitely be uh, be playing a role. Both the um, sort of dynamical states of both the clusters and both the, the difference in mass between the clusters could play a role here. Thank you very much. Um, Giacomo, could you please let me know if we have another question from yeah. YouTube? Yeah, yeah, sir. Uh, Neven Tomicic. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, oh, please, sorry. Uh, nice, nice talk. Um, I am a member of a uh, GASP collaboration uh, where Alessia Moretti also uh, looked the omega wings and wings uh, uh, members of uh, galaxies in clusters. And she looked uh, H2 and H1 uh, gas. But she, her results, uh, we only took uh, highly stripped galaxies, so-called jellyfish galaxies. And those show like opposite features which you uh, saw. Uh, the ratio of uh, molecular gas uh, to stellar uh, amount of uh, uh, disks of galaxies is very highly, uh, very high fraction. It means that uh, we found that the H2 to star ratio are very high, but H1 to star uh, ratio is very low. And when we combine H2 plus H1 uh, compared to the stellar uh, mass, it is comparable to normal galaxies. And we concluded somehow that maybe H2 is converted directly from H1 very uh, drastically. And that's why galaxies are losing H1, but uh, uh, replenishing it uh, into H2. So that's our, those are our results of jellyfish galaxies, which are usually very extreme cases of galaxies. Oh, and only a few of them uh, we trace. So I don't know how it compares to your results. Did you check all type of galaxies or only more like gas stripped galaxies? 
Yeah, thanks a lot for your question. I'm, I'm actually very much aware of that work. Um, and I think, yeah, I think one of the differences is that with jellyfish galaxies, as you say, you really get this strong compression of the gas on one side, which as you can say, can result in the more efficient transformation of H1 into H2. And the other effect that you are probably seeing is that you can get some in situ star formation in the tails of these jellyfish galaxies. So in the end, you end up with more uh, molecular gas. So I think the galaxies that we are looking at here are not necessarily uh, jellyfish kind of galaxies. Um, we did a complete survey of the Fornax luster, so we did not focus on any uh, galaxies with uh, particular stripping features or anything. Um, I'm also not sure that what we're seeing is ramp pressure stripping um, because the Fornix cluster is not necessarily super massive. Uh, we don't expect the ramp pressure to be so strong. And also in the example that I was showing earlier, uh, I'm not sure if that's ramp pressure that we are seeing. Yeah, it, it, it did not. I mean, it looked a little bit uh, stripped, but it's not very, it's not. Yeah, it looks a little bit stripped, but it doesn't really look like uh, okay. the features okay. you see with uh, ramp pressure stripping necessarily okay. also because the velocity field is so messy. So uh, that yes. basically suggests that maybe something else is going on. So yeah, I don't know. I don't think they are the same kind of galaxies. Um, I think they're both environmental effects. I don't, I don't think yes. it's the same thing that we're seeing necessarily. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. So um, I'm going to go for a very interesting question that I can read from YouTube. And the question is actually, how representative are Fornax and Virgo compared to the clusters in general out there? Uh, do we actually have any handle on what uh, a representative galaxy cluster even is, especially with respect to cold gas properties? Yeah, that's an inter interesting question because obviously we don't have so many clusters at uh, very short distances that we can choose from. So, um, so yeah, I guess that's a little, that one is a little bit tricky to answer. I guess in a way the Fornix cluster may be more representative than the Virgo cluster because it is a poorer cluster, um, not quite as massive as the Virgo cluster. So I think we do expect actually many galaxies in the local universe to be in groups and poorer clusters as compared to really massive clusters. So in that sense, it might be representative of the kind of place that uh, many galaxies reside in. But yeah, as you can say, it's, it's uh, as you say, it's uh, it's kind of difficult to know for sure, of course, um, how represented it is, uh, representative it is for, for other clusters out there. So yeah, it would definitely also be helpful to uh, observe more clusters that are similar to one or to the other or completely different to get a better handle on um, yeah what kind of environment does what what kind of processes are important in what kind of environments but yeah great thank you very much for the answer uh, and great so thanks uh, Nikki for the for the very nice talk again and uh, I think we can now move on to the next speaker. Uh, please, uh, Stephen, go ahead and uh, do the introduction. Thank you. Great. So yeah, thank you again, Nikki, for that excellent talk. Um, and yeah, just a reminder to those on YouTube, you can post any questions that you've got uh, in the chat and we'll, we'll feed those to the speakers. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome our next speaker, which is Ashley Thomas Barnes. Uh, he did his PhD half in Liverpool and half in Munich at MPE. Uh, where he worked on the early stages of star formation within the Milky Way, looking at kinematic chemistry and the physical properties of molecular clouds. And now he's doing a postdoc at the University of Bonn, uh, looking at uh, later stages of star formation. And uh, today uh, he will be talking about uh, observations of H2 regions across the galactic center and nearby galaxies. Uh, so Ashley, when you're ready, you can take it away. Stuff. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I guess you can see uh, my screen share. Is this okay? Yes, that looks good. Excellent. Uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to dive straight in here. Um, so here uh, we have a very nice picture um, that you may be familiar with. Those who have kind of joined a few of these talks now may be familiar with this background, but I just wanted to give you a bit of background as to what this background is. Um, and it nicely relates to this talk uh, focused on feedback. So here we have uh, a kind of slightly zoomed out picture to the one that's behind me right now. Uh, and this is kind of a few few uh, objects highlighted here, such as the Eagle Nebula, which is this one, and the Omega Nebula, which is that one. And these are very interesting features uh, due to their feedback. So these are young, massive uh, uh, star forming regions, which have uh, host to several young, massive stars, uh, which are producing a lot of feedback effects and destroying their host molecular clouds. 
And this will be the subject of uh, this uh, presentation today. Um, and in particular, looking at the pressures within these uh, regions. So I just wanted to say, um, I don't know why this didn't come to me at the time, but uh, yeah, we're obviously talking about pressures here. So maybe a slight rename of the talk would be under pressure with the obvious uh, link to the uh, Queen and Freddie Mercury song here. Um, um, David Bowie, sorry. And uh, yeah, absolutely. Look at this YouTube link. Uh, it's a very interesting um, uh, gig that they did in Wembley. And then hopefully I can kind of keep your attention like uh, Freddie Mercury was uh, during that uh, uh, gig. So um, yeah, pressures and uh, under pressure. Uh, so the talk outline, uh, I'm gonna to talk to you why and uh, what's interesting about pressures within the ISM, in particular links to star, uh, star forming regions and feedback and uh, yeah, why now this is uh, interesting. And then I'm gonna go on to the results from two of our uh, kind of works that we uh, uh, have published. One was uh, in the summer of last year, which focused on uh, feedback within the galactic center of the Milky Way and in the central molecular zone and uh, one in a uh, upcoming paper which focuses on feedback across the disks of uh, several nearby uh, galaxies uh, as part of the FANGS collaboration. Okay, so firstly, why is uh, feedback interesting and why is it important? So here we have a very basic picture of a molecular cloud. Okay, so then the molecular cloud is sitting there within the galaxy, within the disk or the center of the galaxy in this kind of host environment. And this is what I'm kind of defining as this circle here, which is the kind of galactic environment. And the galactic environment includes the kind of the weight of the disk of the galaxy, so the stars within the galaxy and the atomic gas within the galaxy and even nearby uh, molecular gas surrounding your molecular cloud. And then the molecular cloud feels this weight of its environment and the weight of obviously itself from the gravity and that makes molecular cloud uh, collapse. And the molecular cloud would collapse and begin to form stars. And there are mechanisms to kind of stop the, the cloud forming stars, um, which is turbulence and the thermal pressure and magnetic fields within the clouds. I won't go into too much detail about those. Uh, that's a completely different talk. Um, but here in this very simplistic picture, let's assume we have this molecular cloud and it collapses to form stars. And there's not very much stopping that. So then this molecular cloud is gonna form stars at a very high efficiency, which we don't necessarily see in the observations. We see that molecular clouds actually have a very low efficiency per, for example, their free fall times, which is of the order of a few percent of stars. So the total mass of your molecular cloud converted to stars per free fall time. So then we need a mechanism to stop the clouds forming stars at very high efficiency. And ooh, too far. And that process is uh, potentially feedback. So feedback is when the massive stars and stars form within your molecular cloud, they start to release a lot of energy and a lot of energy uh, into the surrounding environment and pressure, which pushes against this external pressure of the cloud, the weight of the cloud, and ultimately disrupts and can potentially destroy the cloud itself. And in doing so, these uh, uh, star forming, these, these massive stars within the cloud do so via various uh, internal kind of mechanisms. So these, which I'll come back to later, are potentially the thermal pressure of the, of the uh, ionized gas. So this kind of 10 to the four Kelvin photo ionized gas, the wind, so kind of from there, just their mass loss, uh, the direct radiation pressure. These are very like, luminous, uh, massive stars. And just the photon pressure as can potentially cause an external pressure, internal pressure pushing outwards, and the uh, heated dust. So just from the, uh, the the massive stars warming the dust, the dust itself can then form a pressure pushing outwards. So these internal pressure components can balance and even outweigh the external pressure of the cloud and its environment itself, and ultimately destroy the host cloud. So this is very important as um, let me get rid of that. So then as the, uh, here, some very nice work from uh, Melanie uh, Chavance and Deidre Christen and uh, as part of the FANGS collaboration show that um, the feedback stage, the young stellar feedback stage of uh, molecular clouds is actually very short. So kind of looking at the gas, uh, young sites of star formation and the stars within uh, several galaxies here, they find that the feedback stage is actually of the order only a few mega years and then so you have your molecular cloud and then on a very short time scale that molecular cloud is disrupted and destroyed by this feedback process as I just mentioned. And then you've got, uh, and then converted to, to uh, a cluster. 
So then on the order of a few mega years, it's significantly shorter time scale than before, for example, supernova can go off. So this, the feedback mechanisms of Jung's stellar feedback is very important for destroying the host molecular cloud. And then those supernova, it's very important for those because then they can go off in a very different environment as opposed to going off in the center of a molecular cloud in a very dense environment. These supernova can then go off within a lower density environment and uh, disrupt uh, uh, larger galactic uh, processes. And yeah, simulations show this, for example, uh, see the Silk project. So feedback and understanding feedback is very important. So then why now? So within the galaxy, we now have a, a lot of uh, um, observations covering the whole galactic plane, uh, which can probe feedback um, at high resolution. So for example, with the VLA studying in the radio and the infrared from uh, uh, space telescopes, such as Spitzer and Herschel, nicely covering the whole of the galaxy at high resolution to really peer and study these uh, feedback processes. And what's really key now is that we're kind of getting down to those scales that we can observe within the Milky Way within extra galactic systems also. So for example, with MUSE and the HST, which I'll come on to in half of this talk, we can really get down to the sites of uh, uh, star formation and uh, well, cluster formation, I should probably say, and then study the feedback effects within kind of the whole disks of the galaxy. So it's a really exciting time to kind of parameterize and study uh, feedback across both the Milky Way and extragalactic observations. So this is why it's important, and this is why it's now important to study feedback. So I'm just going to go back, uh, well, go forward, I guess, to the end of the talk here and just show you the summary slide, which I'll slowly fill out during the talk. These are the questions I want you to kind of take away uh, at the end of this talk. So what is the dominating process? What is the dominating mechanism for uh, feedback and destroying these host molecular clouds? And what uh, are all H2 regions overpressured and expanding uh, with respect to their environment? So we'll come back to these as we go along during the talk. So as I said, this, uh, this initial work that I'll focus on during this talk is focused on the galactic center of our Milky Way. Um, so this is a very exciting and interesting region, but I just wanted to highlight some nice work from Grace Olivia looking at the uh, feedback and pressure components of the feedback within the galactic disk, um, which uh, yeah, you can look that up. Um, so then focusing on the galactic center here. Uh, so this is a very, uh, so here I show kind of on the top panel, a three color image. Um, so eight micron, 24 micron from Spitzer, very nicely picking up kind of star forming regions, um, feedback regions, and then a very nice uh, uh, 20 centimeter um, emission from uh, um, the uh, Meerkat uh, image in red there. So this is a very beautiful picture of the galactic center. And this is around kind of the central 200-ish parsecs of the galaxy. This is a very interesting region to study both star formation and feedback as the environment, the densities, the cosmic ionization rate, the turbulence, the temperature, everything's kind of an order of magnitude higher within this environment than, for example, within the disk of the galaxy. So this is a very interesting region in general to study star formation, in particular feedback, because you've got a lot higher pressures, you've got a lot higher stellar density within this region. So then your kind of ambient pressure is a lot higher. So potentially, thinking about feedback, those internal pressure terms could be more difficult um, for them to uh, drive expansion of H2 regions. So then for this initial work, we focused on this small region, which I highlight in the lower panel, which is a super interesting region in, in itself. Um, so we've got on the top here, you see in kind of uh, dark, these are molecular clouds, some of them quite famous molecular clouds, such as the BRIC. So these are 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar masses of quiescent, very dense molecular gas. And then very close to those, we have regions such as SAGE B2, SAGE B1, very famous kind of star forming regions, uh, a lot of feedback within those regions, and they're the regions we'll actually be studying here. And then very close by, we've got clusters, young massive clusters, such as the Archers and Quintuplet cluster. So these are 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 solar mass clusters here, all within this kind of very small 100 by 100 parsec box of our galaxy here. So this is a very interesting region not just to study feedback, but just to study the whole kind of process of star formation here. So for this work, we studied on, uh, we studied uh, observations covering SAG B2 and SAG B1 feedback region to study the kind of feedback mechanism, mechanisms within those regions. So uh, yeah, I won't go into too much detail here uh, for time, but if you want to look at how each of these will, uh, each of these pressure components and uh, were calculated, 
please do go look at the paper. Um, and I'll start to populate this plot here on the left hand side with these various pressure components as we go along. So just to mention, this is a plot of the effective radius, so the size of the H2 regions here in log scale and the pressure. So the pressure on the y-axis, so I should say this isn't, uh, you know, not correct units of pressure, this is pressure divided by Boltzmann constant. Um, so then here, we've just started to populate this plot with the uh, dust reprocessed radiation. So this is the warm dust, um, so the dust that's heated by those massive stars. And we can see for the H2 regions that we, that we have, um, they sit kind of uh, around 10 to the power of six and of the order, these size measurements uh, range around a parsec or so. So these are quite limited in sizes because we're using the infrared radiation for, for, this, uh, for the dust reprocessed emission. So quite limited in size scale, but we'll start to populate on the left-hand side of that plot now. So with the other pressure components, we have here, for example, the warm ionized gas pressure. So this is just the 10 to the four Kelvin gas within the H2 region. Um, so we have a density, the temperature of that gas, and then we can just determine the pressure simply from the ideal gas law. So we can get down to much larger scales here. You can see that they go down to around 10 to the minus three in radius. And that's just because we can probe these with the high resolution radio observations. And then lastly here for this comparison, we can show the direct radiation pressure. So this is the pressure from those photons from the very luminous massive stars. And again, you can see that these populate very um, low radii uh, because we can go to those high resolution radio observations again. So now we can start to pick apart this plot very simply. So on the smallest scale of scales of less than, you know, well, around 10 to the minus three, we see that the thermal radiation pressure is very subdominant. And the direct radiation pressure in this region is almost at the fact, uh, two orders of magnitude higher than, than the thermal. So then the direct radiation pressure, although we don't have winds in the infrared, um, I should say, appears to dominate within this regime. Um, but when going down to scales of around a parsec, um, they uh, become more similar. So then that answers kind of our summary slide, going back to our summary slide, point number one. Um, and then point number two is uh, uh, summarized here. So then um, it's very interesting that these, you know, we start at 10 to the minus three parsecs and we go all the way up to one parsec, but we really don't see any H2 regions within the galactic center that are larger than say a few parsecs. And we know these H2 regions do exist. We see, for example, 30 Doradis and regions within other regions within the LMC and SMC and regions that I'll come to slightly later on that there are H2 regions of you know, 10 plus parsecs, up to 100 parsecs even, um, that do exist. But then we're just not seeing them within the galactic center. And that's not because our observations don't cover that, that's just because they're not there. So it's very interesting to consider why they might not be there. So here it's uh, interesting to plot the kind of ambient pressure within the galactic center, which sits kind of around this 10 to the seven in our pressure units here. And we see that the point at which these uh, H2 regions get to around a few parsecs, then they're actually below the ambient pressure of their environment. So their internal pressure is then lower than the ambient pressure, which means that potentially they could have reached this kind of equilibrium of the internal pressure of the H2 regions with their ambient environment, which has then limited their expansion beyond a few parsecs. So then just to summarize this first initial points, uh, what processes are dominating the feedback. We see that on the smaller scales, the direct radiation pressure, and although we don't have it, potentially the wind and the dust pressure are dominating on those smaller scales. It's definitely not the thermal pressure that it is at least. Um, and then point number two is that are all H2 regions overpressured and expanding? Well, no, not necessarily so. We see that kind of on the scales of a few parsecs, their pressure is actually somewhat similar to their external pressure and potentially that Kind of equilibrium uh, uh, size scale is limiting their expansion. So this is the, kind of the first half of the talk, looking at the galactic center, this very extreme environment within the Milky Way. Um, but now it's really interesting to expand this and look at, like I said, nearby star forming galaxies, disk galaxies similar to the Milky Way, and explore across the whole disk of these galaxies. So from, from their centers to their disks, how these various pressure components vary in kind of really uh, follow this uh, analysis up uh, in a larger sample. 
So this is kind of the work that I'm doing now. So this is part of the FANG survey. So you may notice uh, a couple of familiar faces down here on the bottom. Um, for example, Eric Enselem, who's uh, uh, at ESO. Um, so this is a really great group, uh, a large collaboration um, here. And this uh, um, study aims at really, it focuses on studying the full stage of star formation across uh, nearby disk galaxies. That's from the molecular gas focusing with ALMA, the CO observations with ALMA, looking at MUSE, looking at the atomic line transitions, H-alpha, for example, uh, looking at the, the effects of feedback and later stage supernovae, and then HST really getting at the high resolution cluster um, characterization. So this collaboration has observations spanning all three of these uh, uh, amazing instruments. So the sample is around 90 galaxies studied with ALMA, so high resolution CO2 to 1 observations of the molecular gas, around 40 galaxies covered, getting their stellar populations with the HST, and around 20 of all of these galaxies are covered with MUSE. And this is the sample that I'll be focusing on, which is really used for, as I'll show in a second, getting an amazing picture of the feedback within these sources. So just as an example, and uh, for how beautiful these observations really are, um, so here's a very nice picture of NGC uh, 628 uh, with the HST. So you can see some very nice features, the spiral arms, the center, the galactic, um, yeah, the stellar component here. And you can even see in red some H2 regions, which is shown on here. So regions of feedback, which we were looking at. But now what's really interesting is to plot the MUSE data on top of here. And you'll really see the kind of amazing high resolution, high sensitivity that you get with MUSE across these 20 galaxies. And this is just a single example, so watch this. So then you can really get this nice picture of the spiral arm features. You're getting a lot of diffuse ionized gas in here and very nice individual H2 regions, picking up those individual H2 regions at high resolution and high sensitivity. So just going back and then maybe doing this again, you can kind of compare the two there. It's really nice. And then just to close the loop here with the ALMA observations, so getting at the molecular gas, uh, we can also overplot this on top. So here you can see the spiral arms and the center in the molecular gas also. So kind of using all of these, we can study the pressure components within our H2 region sample within extragalactic sources. So here's just a summary kind of of the size scale and the, the sample that we're looking at. So on the left-hand side, these red points are our galactic center points, which I was previously presenting. <clears throat> the uh, And then the blue points here are our sample for the 19 nearby galaxies studied in the FANG sample. So you can see that we're not probing kind of the extreme high resolution that we had within the galactic center and you can get within the Milky Way. Um, but these are on the size scales of around kind of 10 plus parsecs to up to around 100 parsecs within our galaxies. But this is really amazing. So within our 19 galaxies, we're finding around a sample of 5,000 H2 regions that we can really conduct this analysis on. So we've got a very good statistical sample of H2 regions. And what I'm showing here is basically the summary of the literature of these various pressure components right here. And then previously, I guess there was around a few hundred. So we're really expanding the sample of H2 regions with this work. <clears throat> so first simple plots we can make here, I'm just showing a distribution of the various pressure components within each of the galaxies, showing again, the direct radiation pressure, the thermal pressure, and here, in addition, we have the, the wind uh, ram pressure. So what's interesting here is that the, the blue, so the thermal pressure appears to be the dominating pressure term. So around 10 to the six in our pressure units, which is really interesting. So on the larger scale that we're probing here of 10 to 100 parsecs, we see that the thermal pressure is actually the dominating pressure term. And then just to show that again in a slightly different plot. So going back to our kind of literature part here and putting our CMZ points on the left-hand side and this new sample on the right-hand side, we can see that on the small scales, the direct radiation pressure was definitely dominant over the thermal pressure. So the thermal pressure at least was subdominant. But on the larger scales of around 10 to 100 parsecs, you see that the thermal pressure is actually uh, becoming more dominant uh, by almost, again, two orders of magnitude uh, for these HD regions. So then uh, lastly, uh, our analysis will be to look at are all H2 regions overpressured? So 
kind of briefly going back, we can use all of that amazing information from the stellar distribution, the H1 distribution also, uh, which I didn't mention, uh, but from the VLA and yeah, the molecular gas from, from ALMA to get an idea of the stellar, the, sorry, the, the external pressure of these H2, H2 regions. And then this is what I'm plotting here in green. So this is for each of our H2 regions, we have all of the internal pressure components and in green, the external pressure component. So what's really interesting here is that we can already see that the blue, the blue, the internal thermal pressure for the most part is already larger than the green, so the external part. So it appears that these H2 regions may be potentially overpressured uh, with respect to their environment uh, in general. So let's look at that in uh, slightly more detail here. So on the x-axis, I've plotted the external pressure. So this external pressure confining the H2 regions and the total internal pressure on the y-axis. So just focusing on, let's have a look at, so we have a lot of limits here, but let's just focus on the points for now. Um, so this, this line here on the left of this line shows where the internal pressure is larger than the external pressure. And we see that the majority of points are lie within this regime. On the right hand side of this, this curve, this, this black line, we see that the majority, uh, sorry, several of the points are actually under pressured with respect to their environment. So the majority are over pressured, but several are under pressured. And then these under pressured points lie within a very high external pressure environments. So these under pressured points on the right hand side lie at very high external pressures. So high external pressures points to galactic centers, which we would previously mention. So then lastly, just coming to this plot of the overpressure to check where these points lie within the extra galactic sources. So here we're plotting on the y-axis, the overpressure, which is just the fraction of the total pressure. So all of those internal pressure terms added together divided by the external pressure. So then points less than zero here in log scale are under pressured points larger than zero are overpressured. And then on the x-axis, we plot galactocentric radius of so where they lie within the galaxies. And we see for the most part, the most underpressured H2 regions that we find actually are more towards the galactic centers. So at galactocentric radii less than around a parsec. So this kind of hints that again, those galactic centers are very extreme environments, very highly pressured environments. And those highly pressured environments may be influencing the expansion and limiting the expansion potentially of the H2 regions. So then, uh, yeah, let's run through the talk summary one more time. So if we look at what's the dominating pressure term, what's the dominating mechanism driving feedback? Well, actually it depends on scale. So on the small scales, it's the direct radiation pressure, the wind or the dust, but on the larger scales, it appears to be the thermal pressure that's really driving the expansion. And then secondly, are all H2 regions overpressured and expanding? Well, potentially not. They're within the disks. Uh, they can, uh, they appear to be mostly overpressured with respect to their environment, which means potentially they can get to larger sizes. But within centers, as we saw within the galactic center of the Milky Way, they can be somewhat limited by this kind of high ambient pressure environment, and then their expan expansion can be actually halted uh, due to that. So uh, yeah. I'll end my talk here and leave this summary slide up and take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ashley, for the excellent talk. Um, so yeah, we'll open for questions now. So if uh, on the Zoom chat, if you raise your hand, we will uh, get those questions to Ashley. And also on the YouTube chat, you can write those in, in the comments or in the, in the chat as well. Um, I don't see any questions. Oh, no, we do. Uh, so, Il Sang Yun, if you want to go, a question. Uh, thank you, Ashwin. It's this is a very interesting result, and especially for a, the relative contribution of the, the direct the ionization pressure versus the thermal pressure as a function of the size. I mean, in the small scale, mostly those are from the, the Milky Way central molecular zone. In the larger scale, yeah, it's, it's just from a the different environment. If I think that the radiation pressure is quickly diluted as the radiation energy is diluted as the volume expanding, right? Then the, how this inference based on a, the central molecular zone versus in the more larger scale is 
play in this picture? Do you think that the relative contribution will change at for different environments, or think the those relative contribution is a sort of the universal, uh, no matter where the star forming regions are? That's a good question and something that we could definitely look into. As I said, um, there are uh, works uh, by Grace Olivier and Laura Lopez looking at the galactic disk, which we're actively in the process of uh, looking at and comparing to. We have a uh, bachelor's student which is uh, who's looking at this uh, at the moment. Um, that's something that we should absolutely look into and look at these uh, kind of relative differences. Um, my intuition would be that this isn't something that would be affected. I feel like, um, uh, yeah, these these results should kind of uh, stand that within the disk. I don't see why the the radiation, the direct radiation pressure, which scales as a function of the the, the actually the surface area of the of the um, of the H2 region, would because uh, that's that wouldn't. Um, I don't see how that would change uh, for environments um, as long as you have a kind of nice surface. Uh, area um, over which your luminosity is distributed. But that's something we should absolutely look into. Um, and yeah, as you said, this is an excellent kind of sample to compare to both within the Milky Way and extragalactic observations. Okay, thank you. Um, we also have another question from uh, Nevin Tomicic, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Uh, I have just a question. Uh, did you check or have you checked or your collaboration also uh, how these interplay of different uh, pressures is affecting uh, star formation efficiencies and what is driving actually if the data allows it i am not sure that's i suspect that there's some degeneracy um checking uh, and comparing the star formation efficiency as the star formation rate would be determined from the H alpha emission and yeah. we're determining a lot of the pressure terms from that H alpha emission also. Um, so maybe there's some degeneracy in there. This, mm. um, yeah, this is also something we can definitely look into and it's definitely an interesting question to, to pose. Um, mm. This this pressure work and the FANGS collaboration is uh, yeah definitely something that's still undergoing and uh, mm. we're still kind of looking at angles to investigate. So. Absolutely. I think that's definitely an interesting question to pose and something that we will look into. Okay. So I don't see any more questions, I don't think. Um, I might have a quick question, if that's okay. Um, so I was wondering if you have done any sort of comparisons to simulations to try and sort of understand like the underlying physics behind like the observations that you see. Yes, right. Um, so we made a comparison to simulations. Um, so this is somewhat difficult, but in the paper for the Galactic Center, we made comparisons to simulations from Jim Dale, looking at the expansion and the various pressure components from what we would expect to find in simulations. Um, so taking kind of their simulation, what we would observe kind of loosely, um, kind of based on emission measure, um, kind of estimates, and then converting what they kind of simulate and then converting that to what we would find using our analysis. Um, and this is something that, um, yeah, it's definitely interesting to, to look at. And I think, I mean, we didn't go down that route uh, too much, um, but those kind of results that we came up with at that time, I'd have to kind of look back exactly what we did for those simulations. I don't have a slide in my talk to show that, but um, yeah, I think these results mostly back to what we were finding in the observations and uh but yeah I, I mean ultimately yeah this is a good angle also to follow and to look at uh, in future for the simulations great thank you very much um so yeah i don't think we have any more questions so i'll i guess i'll pass back to giacomo to to close up the session yeah indeed but uh, but in fact uh, we are running out of time but i have a very 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 quick question for ash sorry because uh, it's a curiosity just very if you can give a quick so about the brick in particular so recently it's a bit not i mean on on the, on the edge of your talk but the, the recently there was a paper saying that the brick is significantly closer than, than we thought mm -hmm. uh, so does it impact uh, so what do in general i was just of curiosity what does does mean for you this i mean it has some impact 
Um, potentially, I mean, so am I, I'm I not an expert in how the distance determination was uh, found, but I think there's several arguments against um, the brick being a lot closer than it was actually inferred. So, for example, kind of looking at the velocity of the brick and understanding the velocity and the kind of global velocity of the galactic center, uh, looking at the velocity, the line widths observed towards the brick are very broad, kind of typical of the galactic center. Um, so I think that the yeah, that work that posted the brick a lot closer than um, kind of in terms of distance than uh, it's, it was kind of classically thought of. I think it was around half the distance, which would place it far outside of the galactic center. Um, I'm, I'm, I would be curious to see how, for example, I think extinction laws and the models that they use to infer that distance actually affect their distance determination because all the evidence prior to that would point to the brick being firmly placed within the galactic center. Like I said, based on its chemistry, line widths, uh, systemic velocity uh, would all point to it being within the galactic center. Okay. So, but it's still an open uh, point basically. So it's uh, interesting, right? Yeah. Okay, definitely. good. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank uh, again Gabi and uh, Stephen for the excellent uh, chair, uh, and chatting, excellently the, the, the session. Uh, thank you very much for your help and you, and also, of course, again, congratulations to the speakers and, and for the great talks. And thank you also for, for taking the questions. Thank you for the people to, for participating. We are really happy that, that you can attend these talks and you can make questions to the speakers. And as I said, if you, anyhow, if you, you can also, you will find the details of the speaker on our webpage, it passes the pages. If you, you click on the title of the, of the, of the talk, you, you can download the, the basically the, the, the CV even of the, of the speaker. So you can then contact them and get in touch with them. This is very important. Uh, we are very happy for, about this, and soon the video also link will appear on the web pages, and we, it will stay also on YouTube, so you can watch it later or send it to your colleagues. Uh, with this, I close. I think we can close the, um, the event, and thank you very much again, and see you next week. And congratulations again to the speaker. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.